Let me present a simple truth about language learning. The more you read, the better you will get. Trouble is, reading can be hard. And so in this video, I'm gonna show you eight ways to make reading in a foreign language easier so that you can read more and get fluent faster. Every language learner reaches a point where they think to themselves, right, I should try reading. I've heard that reading is a good way to learn a language. That guy, Ollie on YouTube, keeps saying that we should read stories, so let me try. And so what do we do? Well, we reach for the first novel that we have lying around, something that someone gave us at some point. Maybe you pick up something in a bookshop and you start reading, and then two hours later, you're still on page one with your head in a dictionary. Something's not quite right. For good reason, novels are one of the highest forms of the language you'll ever see. There's lots of difficult words, complex ideas. Uh, they're not supposed to be easy. As language learners, what what we need to do is find a way to actually make reading accessible whilst also keeping it fun. Because the big prize at the end is if we can make reading fun and a part of our daily lives, part of something we just do, then we learn naturally. So I want to show you eight approaches that you can take to reading. Some of them good, some of them not so good, um, but they will all give you uh, different options for starting to read in the language you're learning so that you can actually start doing it now and enjoy it along the way. So what's first? The first way you can make reading easier is by switching from fiction to non-fiction. Books like this, generic non-fiction books about any kind of topic that you are interested in. This is about the history of the Muji company in, in Japanese. Non-fiction tends to have simpler language. It's, it's meant to convey information more than be very beautiful and flowery. So you will find that non-fiction tends to be a lot easier um, right away. Then you've got um, graphic novels. And graphic novels are often, for, you know, for a very similar reason, quite simple. There's less text. You've got the images to help you. Anything that you don't understand in the text, well, you can kind of guess it from the images. Graphic novels are a really great way to, to, to read more easily, and they're available in lots of different languages. There is something, uh, possibly not available in all languages, but in Japanese, the, uh, they're great, and they're called screenplays. So this is Notting Hill, the, the, the film from the late 90s, I think it was. Uh, and you've got here the entire screenplay of the film in Japanese. This particular one, they've also got the parallel text translation. But screenplays are great because, again, it's, it's simple language, also with something that you're familiar with from the film. Often it's also spoken dialogue, which is easier than prose. And so that is also really handy. The other thing you can do that I've done, I remember I did this when I was learning Italian, was to find podcasts in the language and actually yeah, the podcasts that come with the transcript. And then you can just read the transcript of the podcast. Remember also it's likely to be spoken, often more casual, and that's just a different source of material which you might find more inspiring. So nonfiction is generally gonna be easier than fiction. If you want to read fiction though, the single best thing you can do to make it easier for yourself is to read a translation of a book that you've already read. So this book, for example, I read this in English uh, and then I saw it in a bookshop in French when I was in Canada. And I thought, oh, that's cool. I remember reading this. Let me get this and try and read it. And immediately it's easier because you've got two parts when you're learning a language, two things you have to decode. First of all, you've got the form. So it's like, what's the meaning of these, of this, of these words, of this grammar? And then you've got the meaning, so what's actually happening in the story. When you read a translation of a book you've already read, meaning is taken care of. So you kind of know what's happening, what's going to happen, which means that allows, that kind of frees up your brain to then focus on the actual words in the language. So it's gonna be just generally easier. So if there's a book you really like in your mother tongue or a different language, try getting the translation of it in your target language. You will find it a lot easier. Now, next up in the toolkit is the sacrilegious act of throwing away the paperback and instead starting to read digitally. Now, I will say that I am the world's biggest fan of paperbacks. I don't like reading digitally, but for language learning, it is really, really handy because on a Kindle, what you can do is simply get a very quick one-click uh, definition of a word. And you can set this, you can download the dictionary that you want, so you can get either the definition in the target language or a translation into English, whatever you like. And what this does is it allows you to get your head out of the dictionary and spend more time actually reading. The ultimate goal of any uh, attempt to read, any reading program, is to spend more time actually reading because that's where the, the learning really comes from. Uh, and this is very, very good at that. You still need to bring some judgment to bear on the process because if you're a lower level than the book you're reading, you can still spend all your all of your time looking at words. Uh, but if you follow the rule of only looking at words that have cropped up, say, five times, try to minimize that, then what the Kindle allows you to do is just to kind of keep reading in a more flowing way while looking up the words that you really need and doing it 
quickly so that you can just keep on reading. Very, very handy. Obviously, you don't have to use Kindle. There's a bunch of other e-readers out there. Um, you can also do this on the computer if you like, especially for Asian languages where you've got uh, non-phonetic scripts and things like that. Very, very handy way of making reading immediately easier. Parallel text, I am not a fan of. I know lots of people are, but I'm not. And the reason is that I think as much as possible, we should be trying to read in the target language without the distraction of English, because the more English that we have, the less we are really immersing ourselves and giving our brain the opportunity to adapt to the target language. However, it's got to be said that parallel texts will make it easier to decipher the text that you're reading. This is a good example. It's called the Japan Culture Book. So this is nonfiction rather than fiction, but as you can see, you've got the Japanese on one side and you've got the English on the other side. Now, the reason that generally parallel text I find don't really work is because you're restricted by the material that you've actually got. Now, if you could pick your kind of dream novel, uh, the one that you really want to read, and there's a parallel text version of that, then, then brilliant. But more often than not, as language learners, what we do is we go into a bookshop and we just kind of pick up whatever parallel text we've got, uh, they've got just because it's a parallel text and we're not really following one of the golden rules of of reading, which is to consume content that you are interested in. Right? This is a so-called compelling input. Anything that you do as far as possible, if you choose stuff that you really want to read, it's going to make everything easier because you're motivated. So the kind of basic structural problem of parallel text is that you're very unlikely to have the thing that you really want to read available in parallel text format. Um, but if you can do it, and you, or if you don't care about that, then you've got the exact translation of, or the approximate translation, I guess, of the thing that you're trying to read, which is gonna make it a lot easier. Now, this is one of my favorite techniques of all. I use it all the time. I'll explain why it's so good in just a second. Uh, here's what you do. Step one, take a book you have already read in English. In this case, it's the English translation of The Devotion of Suspect X, fantastic book. And then you get the translation, or in this case, the original Japanese of that book. And then you literally read them in parallel like this, so you, you know, as you turn a page in the physical book, you, you turn the page in the Kindle so that you can follow along uh, exactly at the same time. Now, isn't this just parallel text? Is it not the same thing that I was criticizing a moment earlier? Well, not exactly. Here's why. First of all, you've got the, you're following the golden rule of choosing compelling input. So you're choosing something that you really, really, really want to read, which you generally can't do with parallel text, remember, because you're stuck with whatever they've actually got on the shelf. Here, you're choosing something that you've read, you've really enjoyed. So not only do you really like it, you've already read it in the English, so you know the plot, and then you've, you're reading digitally, which means that you've got the speed benefit as well of being able to look up words if you really need to. You could, of course, do it with two paperbacks. It's just a bit more practically cumbersome to be sitting there holding two paperbacks. So I like to do this, because you can kind of hold it all at the same time. This is brilliant because you are reading stuff that you really enjoy in the target language, What's not to love? Along the lines of reading nonfiction, blogs are a fantastic way to get into reading. Blogs tend to be written in, in a way that's a lot simpler than regular books because one of the rules of kind of communicating on the internet in a format like a blog is you've got to keep it simple. People have a shorter attention span, they're often reading on a screen. And so one of the things that I did last year when I was learning how to set up my, my lighting here properly was read this blog by a Japanese guy who writes all about how to, makes videos as well, but got a, a cool blog, all about how to do three-point lighting and stuff like that. So I was following the golden rule of compelling input, right? So something that I really uh, care about, really want to learn. Also, it's made simpler by the fact it's on a, it's on a blog, but it's authentic language because the guy's writing in Japanese for Japanese people. So finding blogs on topics of interest is a great way to just get into reading. If you're reading online as well with a web browser, you can also use lots of different tools which exist that give you things like instant translations. There's a whole bunch of these things now where you can kind of highlight words, save them into flashcards and stuff like that. Personally, I don't bother doing any of that stuff. I just like to spend as much time reading as possible. So blogs on topics of interest and you're away. Now, despite all of the things I've already talked about, which will make reading easier, if you are still at a low level in the language, which I know many of you watching will be, you're still going to find it a little bit too hard. Really, up until you're kind of at an intermediate level in the language, reading any kind of authentic content can be quite tricky. And so this takes us into the realm of graded material. Now, graded material literally means that you're taking the language, the authentic language, and making it simpler for learners. The obvious criticism of graded material is, well, it's not authentic language, so you're not learning the kind of real thing. My view is that if that material gets you reading and spending time in the language, then that is by far a better um, a better thing than, like, than just not doing it at all. So graded readers are the most common thing out there. There are many, many, many thousands of different uh, books. I've got my own, so I'll show you what I've got. These are books Oh, we have these in like 20 languages. These are for beginners in Spanish, beginner kind of meaning 
A2 to B1, so it's not complete beginner, but it's kind of low level. Then we have intermediate versions. And graded readers, when they're done well, they really contain a lot of features that help you learn. So you've got, for example, images that set the context so that you're just more aware of what you're getting into. Uh, you've got chapters which are on the short side so that you're not getting you know, bogged down by 100 page chapters or, or whatever it may be. And everything is just made a lot simpler. So graded readers, you can, they're usually fiction, but there are more and more graded readers out there which are non-fiction as well. So for example, I've been producing this series called Topics That Matter, and this is World War II in simple Spanish. We've got others on things like climate change and things like that. And so this, if you're not into fiction, which I know people, not everybody is, this gives you a way of actually kind of reading um, in a kind of simple way, but on topics that interest you. And for, like, for me, the World War II is endlessly fascinating. And so this is stuff that's interesting at a simpler level. So Grady readers, good in my book. Last but not least, we've got the famous advice to read children's books. And this is something which is kind of like, everyone starts here, go, I want to read something simple in a language, let's read kids' books, because kids' books are simple, right? Well, in reality, kids' books are almost never simple. Most of us have forgotten what it's actually like to read kids' books, but what kids' books are not is kind of very simple stuff like John went to the shop, John said hello. Now, instead, you've got things like superworms and creepy crawlies. It's like a chock full of vocabulary, which are really, you don't need. You never, literally never use as an adult, like wizard hats and things, <laughs> things like that. So children's books, you know, they have the big disadvantage as well of not being of interest to you. If you are an adult trying to learn a foreign language, chances are you don't want to spend your time uh, reading stories like this. I mean, you could do for, you know, for interest, maybe a book that you read when, when you were a kid, but as a general rule, you don't want to be doing that. You want to be reading stuff that's on topics that interest you or novels which are you know kind of up your street. So children's books, really, I don't see any benefit whatsoever to, to using them. If you have a kid that you're teaching, then you know obviously you can combine things there and everything should be tailored to your individual situation. But as a general rule, kids' books, I'd steer well away of them. What I want you to do is to pick one of the eight ways that I've shown you here to make reading really easy and just commit to it for a week or two. Often the difference between someone that gets really far in their language learning and someone that doesn't get very far at all is just the materials that they choose to use. So pick one way and give it a shot for a couple of weeks. Not just the materials though, it is also the technique. Over here, I've got a video that shows you how to learn languages through stories. And then just below that, there is my story learning kit, which is completely free and it's chock full of masterclasses that will show you how to learn a language with stories.